next slide. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and, uh, and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this uh, dialogue session with uh, Ambassador uh, Zelik here. Uh, before I, uh, I introduce uh, him and uh, we, we go into our, our discussion, uh, let, me, uh, let me first uh, deal with, uh, with another pressing matter. Uh, the world and the Singapore, of course, is aware of the, uh, the death of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, who now lies in state at uh, Parliament House before uh, the state funeral on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on Sunday. Uh, Mr. Lee, of course, was uh, uh, a graduate of uh, Raffles College uh, right here on this, uh, this campus uh, before it became the University of Singapore and then, uh, then uh, NUS. And uh, as uh, the president of the university said yesterday, this is where he uh, met his wife and uh, several others who uh, formed that first generation of uh, Singapore leadership uh, uh, with him. Uh, my old colleague at the London School of Economics once described Mr. Lee as a political superman, albeit in charge of a metropolis. Of course, he made Singapore much more than just a metropolis and indeed uh, strode the Asian and world stages. So uh, as, a, as a mark of respect and uh, in the memory of, uh, of Mr. Lee, I would ask you to, uh, to rise and observe a minute's uh, silence, please. Thank you. Oops. Okay. Well, we have uh, a large turnout uh, this afternoon. Um, let me let me introduce uh, our, our our guest, uh, Robert Zelik. Uh, has uh, a long, long experience in uh, global public policy, particularly in international economic policy, now spanning uh, three decades or so. Uh, he was president of the, uh, of the World Bank uh, until 2012, and currently serves as uh, the chair of Goldman Sachs' international advisors. Uh, he serves on the board of Temasek, uh, the sovereign wealth fund here, and laureate international universities as well as the International Advisory Board of Rolls-Royce. Uh, he is also a senior fellow at uh, Harvard University's Kennedy uh, School of Government, uh, of which he is uh, an alumnus. Uh, Ambassador Zelik uh, was uh, in uh, the George Bush administration, uh, George Bush Jr. administration in both terms, uh, first as uh, the United States Special Trade Representative. Uh, some of you will recall that on his watch, uh, the US-Singapore FTA was uh, uh, negotiated and concluded. And then uh, in President Bush's second term, he was Deputy uh, US uh, Deputy Secretary of, uh, of, of State. Uh, he also served in the uh, Reagan and uh, Bush Senior White Houses. Uh, he was counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury, Under Secretary of State, and Deputy Chief of Staff uh, at the White House. And uh, during that period, uh, Mr. Zelik was uh, very much involved in the decisions that uh, led to the end of the Cold War and the reunification of, uh, of Germany. Uh, he's received a number of awards, including the Knight Commander's Cross from Germany for his work on Germany's unification, uh, and several others, which uh, uh, I, uh, I, 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 won't, uh, I won't go into. Um, he's, uh, he's an alumnus of the Harvard Law School, uh, as well as from uh, uh, Swarthmore College. Uh, that uh, that, that uh, leads me to 
our session. Uh, this is supposed to be a dialogue session. I've heard some of them previously advertised as fireside chats, which I think most incongruous here in Singapore, because it's the last place where I would want a roaring, crackling fire, uh, given this level of humidity. Um, and we are going to talk about uh, a vast range of topics, uh, a veritable tour d'horizon uh, around the world. Uh, I will fire off uh, questions to Ambassador Zelik uh, on, on a range of topics and then open it up uh, to, to, to the floor. Firstly, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Mr. Zelik. Um, let me start with um, a big, broad question on the global economic outlook. Now, um, the news is decidedly mixed, seven years almost since the end of the GFC. We have the US on the rebound. Uh, we have Europe and Japan still in the doldrums. Uh, we have an emerging market slowdown. Uh, we have a commodity super cycle behind us, uh, and perhaps we are at the end of an era of uh, cheap money. So, uh, where do you think we are, and where do you think we might be heading? Well, before I uh, address that <laughs> cosmic question, <laughs> um, let me thank all of you uh, for coming and say what, a, what an honor and a pleasure it is uh, to be at this school. Uh, I arrived, uh, coincidentally, on Sunday night, just as uh, Lee Kuan Yew was passing on. And uh, I need to share a moment with you on this. I first had a chance uh, to meet uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew uh, about 25 years ago. I was here at a meeting with Secretary Baker uh, when he was Secretary of State and I was working with him. But uh, I had the good fortune of having a number of opportunities to speak with him. He was very kind uh, and willing to see me when I would come through in different capacities. Um, and I won't uh, tell you all the things I've learned, although I mentioned that there were a huge number of them, and I certainly couldn't say them in as blunt fashion as he used to communicate them to me uh, on topics. Uh, but I was just struck. Uh, I had a chance to go over to the Astana uh, on, on Monday. But what, what kept going through my mind is actually a recollection from a very different part of the world. Uh, some of you may have had the opportunity uh, to visit London, and if you have, you might have had a chance to go to St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, which is not only an extraordinary building, but it's also a memorial and burial place for many uh, citizens that have achieved great recognition in Britain. And one aspect of the memorials that struck me most was a plaque for Sir Christopher Wren, who also happened to live about 91 years. Uh, and uh, this was a plaque created by his son. Uh, and the plaque says, uh, Si monumentum recaris circumspice. And uh, my Latin is not good, but if it would help you in English, it's, if you would see the man's monument, look around. So this was St. Paul's Cathedral, which is the architect with Sir Christopher Wren. And so uh, as I've been reflecting on Lee Kuan Yew's passing, I keep thinking as I have spent the past couple of days driving around Singapore from some of the sessions, this is the man's monument. But in particular, this school is another example uh, of his interests and uh, his legacy. So I think it's not only a particular uh, opportunity for me, but I hope for all of you, uh, because as you think about the careers that you're having from different countries around the world, uh, the legacy that uh, Lee Kuan Yew left in terms of extremely high standards, sense of purpose uh, to his country, uh, moral rectitude, tough, clear-minded views, uh, and honesty and integrity are some fantastic characteristics that I hope all of you will bring back to the sphere of public service, which, uh, like Lee Kuan Yew, I always felt uh, was the highest calling. So I compliment you for your studies, and I'm pleased to be here. Uh, having filibustered this macroeconomic question, I'll now try to turn to that. <laughs> um, I guess w what I've reflected on, uh, and th this may run through a little bit of our dialogue, uh, my true love is history. 
but I wasn't quite sure I could make a living at it. So I tried some things in government and finance and other areas. But I always come back to history as my uh, reference point. And uh, it's natural when people live and operate in an era that they take the current circumstances as being normal. They have to operate in them. But I think particularly in terms of financial and economic terms, uh, it's very important to step back and recognize that the past five, six, seven years have really still been quite extraordinary in terms of government policies, first fiscal and then particularly now monetary policies. And one of the effects, of course, of these truly unusual monetary policies you had in the United States, now you see in Japan, European Union, and elsewhere, is from a financial perspective, it obviously means that it increases asset values, it dampens uh, interest rates, it has an effect on kind of dispersion of risk uh, assumptions. Um, but one of the challenges that I think we still have to face is a handoff from these extraordinary monetary policies to private sector-led growth. Um, and in a way, uh, the United States will be the first experiment in this because it's well, coming out of the uh, extraordinary quantitative easing policies. Uh, Japan still in the midst, uh, Europe in a sense just engaging in it. And from a, again, from an investor point of view, but I think it has broader implications, the challenge is whether values are based on extraordinary money flows or to what degree they're based on underlying fundamentals of the real economy. Uh, if you're in private business, ultimately your earnings have to have the last word about uh, the values. And the reason I emphasize this is that I think what we are already seeing in markets, but you're going to see in policy as well, is a greater differentiation based on countries doing structural reforms. And so we can come to this a little bit more, but if you reflect on the challenges of Europe, it's not just extraordinary monetary policies, it's ultimately a question of who will do the structural reforms for productivity or growth. If you look at China, the whole issue is moving to a different growth model uh, in structural reforms. If you look across emerging markets, some countries like Mexico have been ahead in terms of doing structural reforms. And obviously, in Singapore, which is a country that always kind of feels uh, the press of policy paranoia, if you will, to kind of be on the leading edge, this is obviously a topic for discussion. So I think uh, one of the questions going forward will be, you know, we, in the United States, we haven't had an interest increase, interest rate increase since 2006. A lot of people working in markets have never experienced an interest rate increase. And, and I think one of the questions uh, in the overall economic system will be how these underlying real economy fundamentals will be reflected at both the private sector and public sector as eventually kind of the wave of money has to be withdrawn. And there are some risks, of course, that you could be creating uh, other risks through these extraordinary policies, whether in terms of asset prices or other risk mismatches. Th that, um, that leads me to a question on the, on the United States. And uh, of course, I, I read your comments as meaning structural reform is not just about developing countries and emerging markets. It's very much about the West, the traditional West as well. Um, so let, 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 let's take a look at the United States. Um, the U.S. is proving yet again that it is the most innovative economy on Earth. Uh, it's back as a sort of motor of, uh, of global growth, at least for the moment. Um, it is in the throes of an energy revolution, perhaps in the early stages of a manufacturing revolution. It has the most advanced services economy on Earth. But on the other hand, it's still a fiscal mess, and it has Washington gridlock. And what perhaps we see in the outside world is still American weakness in terms of a display of global economic leadership, not just on the security front, but also on the economic front. And that leads doomsayers to say that the US is in inexorable decline, both domestically and, and externally. But is there a serious prospect of, of an American economic renaissance and a translation to reinvigorated global economic leadership? Um, 
And that's surely related to the prospects for structural reform in the United States, is it not? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you've got a good combination there, and let me try to address it at a few different levels, including maybe the political economy and mm -hmm. policy level. Um, I was in Beijing in December and talking with a number of the economic reformers, and one of the things I was struck by, as your question suggested, is the mood in China about uh, the teacher having to learn lessons, in this case the United mm -hmm. States learning lessons after the financial crisis, uh, had evolved to a recognition that while people aren't exactly sure how, the United States seems to regenerate itself. Um, uh, whether for good or ill, I'm old enough to have gone through a few of these cycles. Uh, I was having to fight protectionists in the United States in the 80s who thought Japan was going to take over the U.S. and the world economy, and I used to try to make the case then, and it's a hard case to make if you're a free trader, that I couldn't quite tell you what would be the new industries that would replace the old ones, but I was confident that there would be ones. And indeed, if you look at the Googles, I mean, this was the era where Microsoft was just starting, and now Microsoft is pushed aside by sort of many others. But in the near term, let me share this perspective and then go to some of the, the structural points. I think uh, the good news is in the United States is in the midst of a rather broad-based but modest recovery. And I emphasize the modest because it's actually the slowest recovery we've had since World War II. And that's a subject of some uh, political debate. Um, given the importance of consumption to United States uh, demand, a key factor is to look at employment and income. Um, and the good news is you've had some increase of jobs. Wage rates not really going up that much. But from an inside perspective, and this would give you a sense of, say, what the Federal Reserve is looking at, one of the uncertainties is that while the unemployment rate is down to about 5.5%, the labor force participation rate is at as low a level, it's just a little bit above the lowest level from 1978. So one of the questions is whether the People, often the baby boomers, uh, who left the workforce because of the crunch, will they come back in or will they stay out? And so this is a question uh, that people will work, watch in terms of wage rates. There's a second issue that will be watched closely by the Federal Reserve, and that's um, the issue of household formation. And here again, you know, part of the story, going back to your first question, is what is the reference point that people use? When, if you're in markets or policy, people are often trying to have a comparison. If you look at um, the housing sector, one would have expected it to bounce back more strongly than it has if you look at household formation. Um, but you have a generation that experienced a great tumble of housing values, and so they may have an attitude towards renting and buying property that's different than, say, sort of when I grew up. Um, and then another factor is obviously what happens in terms of wages and price inflation, and these are the issues I think you're going to see the Fed sort of watching closely. But going back to your structural point, uh, the way I would describe it is the good news is that in the private sector, um, there is an ongoing structural reform. You mentioned energy, but just to give people an example of this, you know, the United States tied oil production has increased about 4 million barrels a day over the past five years. That's about an 80, 90 percent increase of U.S. oil production. Um, and that's more oil than is produced in any of the OPEC countries other than Saudi Arabia. And this is just a function of a combination of, of innovation, the technology had been around actually, uh, access to capital, some individuals driving with an idea, and frankly subsoil rights, which made this easier. But it's not only energy. It's if you, uh, I, you mentioned I'm a fellow up at the Kennedy School at Harvard. If you go walk around Cambridge, <coughs> Massachusetts these days, you'll see a whole bioengineering industry with a series of startups developing there. You obviously see this in the software business and in related issues such as big data. And we mentioned a little bit about Europe. I think one of the challenges for this region and for Europe will be the adaptability of, of sectors to use data and information in a very different fashion. So let me give you a concrete example. About a year ago, I was visiting the senior management team at John Deere, which is the company that makes all the tractors and a lot of the construction equipment. And 
they were showing me that they now have the ability to download data onto a tractor to adjust the mix of inputs row by row to increase productivity 10 to 15 percent. But <clears throat> like many business executives, they didn't want their sophisticated tractors to just become the platform for somebody else's information service because no businesses wants to be commodity priced. So they were trying to figure out how they could connect big data services with what would have been seen traditionally as a sophisticated equipment producer. At about the same time, Syngenta, which is a fertilizer company, or excuse me, Monsanto, a seed company, was buying Climate Corp because they didn't want to be commoditized in terms of the seed production, and so they wanted the data combined with that. And Syngenta is a fertilizer company was looking at the same thing. And I use these as examples because we could go through sector after sector mm -hmm. after sector that are going to go through huge transformations. So when I talk to CEOs around the world, frankly, in different sectors, what they tend to focus on are number one, the good news for this region, which emerging market should they be in because they know that's the future of growth. Uh, number two, a concern about um, some 25-year-old in Silicon Valley that will develop software applications that disintermediate their whole business mm -hmm. structure. And third, how they integrate this big data system. So I was reading in the Financial Times and Wall Street Journal this morning, again, this, the, the data privacy question, which comes up in the context of Europe, it's going to be a very big issue in terms of people's ability to continue to, <clears throat> to innovate uh, and with productivity. Robotics is another sector. So the U.S. private sector, uh, fortunately, continues to be innovative, although if you look at the productivity statistics, which are always have to be a little bit their different views about their creation, They're, they've slowed down. So one of the debates in the United States is that will this innovation sort of lead uh, to productivity? But as you point out, and I think properly so, the problem in the United States is on the public sector side. So the structural reforms of a tax reform system, uh, immigration, uh, some of our entitlement spending. <clears throat> now, having said this, what's important to keep in mind with the United States is it's a big country and it's a federal system. And so, frankly, you've got a number of innovative governors doing things in states in some of these areas. Um, and it's the nature of the U.S. experimental system that some of those lessons will turn out well and others will they'll draw from them. Just as in China, the different provinces <coughs> draw from another, and I think, frankly, you'll see this in the Indian state system as well. Now, you connected that at another level to kind of uh, the U.S. role in the international economy. And uh, on this one, I frankly uh, think that there has been a, uh, a challenge for the United States in terms of stepping forward, although I hope with things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership or TTIP with Europe that there will be a, uh, an opportunity here for the United States to help set the future structure and, and rules. And part of this is, uh, you know, is, is the nature of, uh, I don't mean to be overly critical or partisan about this, but it's kind of the concept that the administration has. Part of it's the challenge of dealing with the Congress because it's a, mm -hmm. not a parliamentary system. Um, but I'll leave you with this thought because I think it's also relevant. Um, I think, particularly as we approach a presidential election year, uh, there, you'll, you'll pick up a debate in the United States about the U.S. role internationally, where when President Obama first took office after President Bush 43, as we refer to him because his father was the 41st president, um, there was a sense the United States had overextended itself. Uh, it had fought wars for uh, you know, two wars for 10 years. It looked like it spent trillions of dollars, a huge commitment of life and treasure. And I think President Obama partly reflected that. And so whether due to his political sense or his ideology or whatever, he's kind of a pulled the pendulum back. I think there's a sense now, but people will debate how this should take form in policy, that perhaps the pendulum swung too far back and that if the United States disengages, that uh, benign things don't often fill the, the vacuum. Um, on the other hand, to be fair to... Uh, young Americans or their parents all across uh, the United States, these problems aren't so easy to solve. I mean, so if you go look at the challenges of the modern Middle East, this may be with us for a while. Just, just a quick follow-on to that, that broad theme. Um, 
there's a remarkable correlation um, uh, from the beginning of the Pax Americana, I guess, between domestic economic performance and the US's role on the international stage in global economic policy. Um, isn't uh, a pendulous swim, swing back in the other direction very much dependent on economic fortunes at home? Well, um, it's interesting you focus on that because um, uh, a lot of the work that I've done in my career, but also in sort of writing and in a university environment, is to focus on the combination of economics and security. This is not a shock to people living in East Asia. Um, but uh, I think sometimes this is, there's a little bit of a bureaucratic explanation for this. Uh, if you actually look at U.S. policymaking over the first 150 years, there was actually a lot of connection between economics and commerce and America's role in the world. I think after World War II, with kind of the rise of a national security state, um, there was a more heavy focus on the political military dimension. And this even shows up in the people who turn into those, uh, mm -hmm. those posts. So one of the arguments that I've made uh, is the need to not only integrate those more effectively, um, but to um, have the United States appreciate that first off, uh, our ability to perform well globally depends on getting the domestic house in order. And this is always a challenge in a world of politics. Uh, recognizing that now and then we have to clean up our own mistakes as opposed to blame other people for them, which is the heart of free trade, which is an area you work in. Um, but more generally, uh, to recognize that the international order uh, is one that the United States has an interest in strengthening, but also adjusting. So we, we could come to this a little bit, but I think one of the, the biggest changes for your uh, careers is that, I don't want to overstate this, but you know, in, in my sort of professional lifetime, it started out at heavily in a G7 world. So it was you know, what was happening in the US economy, the European Union, and, uh, and Japan. Well now, obviously, if you're looking about roles of world growth, so you know, over the past, even with the slowdown in emerging markets over the past five years, two thirds to three quarters of the world's growth is from developing countries. So there's a, this has implications for the trading system, rules-based system, currencies, international finance. And frankly, uh, we're just struggling to come to terms with that. And it'll be critical that we do. So we, in a sense, we both preserve the best parts of the open system that allowed East Asia to have its success, mm -hmm. as well as other parts of the world, but also adapt it. And this, is, this was the origin of some uh, a phrase I developed in 2005 with China as a responsible stakeholder, that China had benefited from the international system, but it also needed to share the responsibilities as a stakeholder in the system. Okay. Well, let's, um, you, you mentioned this a little earlier. Let's take so one aspect of American leadership, um, and that's the, the TPP. Um, so, uh, Mike Froman, uh, your, uh, your most recent uh, successor as, as USTR, says that uh, uh, it is close to, uh, to, the, uh, to the end of the negotiation. Uh, there are still question marks over uh, the external negotiation with other TPP partners. But of course, there's another big question mark domestically, and that revolves around trade promotion authority uh, by, by the Congress. Um, is the Obama administration doing enough to display leadership on both fronts, domestic and external, to get the TPP concluded? Uh, if not, what should it be doing? Well, let me start. I, I think uh, Mike Froman, who I urged to take the job as opposed to stay in the White House, I think is a highly competent individual. He's close to the president. He certainly understands the substance. Um, one challenge is, uh, for all trade negotiators, field that you know, uh, is it's one thing to talk, it's another thing to close. Okay. And as somebody who's lived in both the public and private sector, uh, I always find this interesting. I, I, I don't find it hard to close. I actually get, find it interesting to do deals. 
but some people will shrink back mm -hmm. uh, because it's never a perfect fit. You know, so you mentioned German unification. That was one I was working on 25 years ago. That was a big challenge of trying to get all the pieces together. And so um, we'll, we will see whether the administration uh, can kind of reach that point. And I, I think what they'll find is that uh, even after the biggest issues, which might now relate to Japan, there will be a series of, quote, little things that require a lot of sort of complex interaction. Having said that, let's keep in mind, the United States is negotiating with 11 other countries, including Singapore. We already have free trade agreements with six of them, okay? So what you're really talking about is adding Brunei, New Zealand, which is always a dairy tough issue, but the dairy industry has changed, um, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Japan, okay? And so uh, while I'm a strong supporter of the TPP, and I think it's a great idea, and I'm trying to help with it, I do think that one has to recognize you've already got the base of this with, uh, with a lot of the, the core countries. And what it really will come down to heavily is the issues with Japan. And on that, um, I think that uh, Prime Minister Abe, who is in the midst of his own structural reform, uh, mm -hmm. realizes that trade could be a vehicle for transforming Japan. So far, the third arrow has not quite hit the target. And so I think he's willing to take the political risks to take on some of these items, but he needs to know that his negotiating partner has the authority to get the deal done with Congress without amendment. Um, and now we start to get to the here and now. Um, I think that the good news is there, there is still a very strong support among Republicans, the president's opposition party, to move ahead on, on trade, even though there's no love lost uh, for the president. What's happening right now is that, uh, because the Senate will go out in about two weeks, is that the Democratic and Republican leading members of the Finance Committee are trying to decide uh, how much concession to give to Democrats who, even though it's the President's party, are more protectionists. And there's a question about a clawback provision about whether they could pull back TPA. And in this case, you have the irony of the Republicans trying to preserve executive authority for the President. Um, but Senator Wyden, who's the Democrat who's working on this, is trying to bring along additional Democratic votes. Um, I believe they will come to some terms, whether before or after the recess, and I hope that will create an opportunity in April when Prime Minister Abe comes that the United States and Japan can at least close on the key items and there'll be other items with, with other countries. Um, then there's the questions of passage of Trade Promotion Authority. And here, um, the president has been more active uh, and that over the past couple months, um, but uh, he's not, his, his strength has not been doing the politics with Congress. Um, and this is a particularly challenging one because uh, for people like me who are trying to bring along Republican votes, it's often hard if the president can't get his own Democratic votes. So this will be a bit of a horse trading uh, process. Uh, I believe it's doable. Uh, but the president will really have to put his shoulder that I didn't want to do. Let's just say I didn't have to. I didn't have too much margin for error. Let's let's move across the uh, the Pacific. Can, can I just because um, it, it's relevant to your question, mm -hmm. and I know it's a topic. Uh, mentioned a little bit about the Asian Infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Investment Bank. Uh, some of you may have noticed I gave an interview last week where I was critical of the administration, the U.S. on this. It really fits this topic because, you know, I I think that um, I think the U.S. is mistaken as a matter of policy for resisting this bank. And then on top of it, I think tactically, it's been executed very poorly. But, but as important as the position, let me explain the logic. And that is, if you want China to participate in the international economic system, uh, if the Chinese come up with an idea that serves a clear need, which is infrastructure, frankly, the person they put in charge of it, Jin Le Quinn, who had been with the Asian Infrastructure Bank. He comes to the United States. I think he wanted to try to develop a bank that had reasonable standards. And th these are legitimate concerns about anti-corruption, procurement, other issues, governance. I think actually 
it would have been wiser to embrace the institution of ways where you could interconnect the Asian infrastructure bank with the existing multilateral system. Or to draw another analogy, when I was at the World Bank, we launched something with the Arab funds, where they had capital, their capacity for some of the analytical aspects wasn't as strong as the World Bank, and we partnered with them on a series of things. So, you know, I, I, there are aspects of Chinese policy that I don't concur with, and I'm not necessarily saying that the BRICS bank is at the same level of development or whatever is intended with uh, the Silk Road. I can't quite figure that out yet. You know from Sri Lanka this is an issue there. But in this case, I think um, you know, it's a mistake for the United States to not adapt the international economic order and systems to this potential contribution. And then the devil will be in the details, of course, of how it's executed. But so it's important whether we're thinking about currency and exchange rate issues, whether we're thinking about trade, whether we're thinking about aspects like infrastructure investment, service sector, other development, that people be a little bit creative in redesigning these systems. Okay. Um, well, that, that's, that's a convenient bridge to uh, so Asia broadly, and uh, let's, start, let's start with, uh, with, with, with China. I have a few questions for you. Um, Martin Wolf, in uh, one of his uh, FT columns, said that China is now one of the big three, alongside the US and the EU, in that whatever it does at home has international reverberations. It has that kind of critical uh, economic weight. Uh, when you were president of the World Bank, uh, you initiated uh, um, a report that became the World Bank DRC 2030 report, and that fed uh, in important ways into what was announced at the uh, third plenum a year and a half ago. Uh, a decisive shift to the market economy is what the Chinese leadership called it, uh, to rebalance the economy, to make it more weighted towards consumption, less towards investment, and so on. A year and a half on, we have seen a few micro reforms announced, some of them in financial markets, but no really big major reform. So the question I have on the domestic reform front is, how serious is it? How confident are you that this will be a decisive shift uh, beyond the very short term? Uh, or might it be too little, too late, because the vested interests at the heart of this party state will block it. OK. Um, let me start, since this is a school of public policy, by giving you, again, a perspective of how all those things that you study about good analysis and you wonder how policy is made or not made or screwed up, give you a little sense of uh, using this example of the China 2030 report. And it actually fits our discussion we just had in the Asian Infrastructure Bank. The World Bank and China actually have a very strong history together, uh, going back to Robert McNamara and Deng Xiaoping, and not just financial. In fact, what the Chinese always emphasized was that at critical points in their reform process, they engaged the U.S. and the international economic community to stimulate ideas in the process. And in the 80s, there was a floating seminar for four or five days down the Yangtze River. In the 90s, there was another exercise. And the China 2030 report uh, had its origins in a very interesting conversation. I, I, I was visited by a Chinese official as we were approaching the 30th anniversary, 2010, of relations between the bank and China, and they said, Bob, you know, people always think China likes to celebrate anniversaries, and we do, but, you know, actually, let's try to make this into something more substantial. So why don't you, they were suggesting to me, recommend to our superiors that the United, or that uh, the World Bank and China uh, do this, this report. So it's very interesting. So here's the Chinese putting the thought in my idea, and this is partly came from the Ministry of Finance, and the basic issue was how to avoid the middle income trap was kind of the, the topic. And that's what led to the China 2030 report, and I think part of its value was, as you pointed out, we did it with the DRC, we did it with Chinese compatriots. It wasn't just an analytical piece of work, and here's another lesson for all of you, is that what I used to tell people at the World Bank is we can't just give people textbook solutions. If, 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 the, if we're not adapting the solution to the circumstances, if it doesn't really work, we haven't really solved the problem. So then let's come to the third plenum and the points drawing from it. 
I would start by saying that I have a high regard for the Chinese leaders for recognizing after 30 years of 10% growth that they needed a serious change in model. Frankly, most economies in the world, Singapore might be the one exception, if they were doing that sort of growth level, they just probably keep doing it until they, they hit the wall. So that was a good point. Second observation, it's important to keep in mind, however, that this economic shift is not driven by Xi Jinping or Li Keqiang and others all of a sudden opening up a textbook and discovering, you know, uh, uh, Friedman. It, it basically, the core issue here is the preservation of the Communist Party. Yeah. And whenever you look at economic reform or any other issue in China, one has to keep in mind that that is the number one objective of Xi Jinping. And again, to give you a sense of this, you know, many of you may know that there is a, a, a documentary that China did about the fall of the Soviet Union. And all the cadres were directed to see this film. And unlike in Europe, Gorbachev was not necessarily seen as the hero. He was seen as the guy that abandoned the party and screwed up the whole system. So when you look at anti-corruption, when you look at the self-criticism campaigns, there's some unusual echoes here. <laughs> it's one uh, in including some Maoist methods here. At the same time, you're doing economic reform. And it's important to keep that in mind because it's not just an economic exercise. Third, for the economics itself, um, Again, I think a lot of the Western analysis, not surprisingly, focuses on sort of day-by-day -day markets. Yeah. And I think that's a mistaken prison. These individuals are working over a seven to 10 year time frame, And their aim is to have Xi Jinping be at the same level as Mao and Deng in terms of making a huge shift for China. And then, uh, and at the same time, they're having to deal with the aftermath of their stimulus programs and others. So I've been of the view that, at least if you talk to the reformers, they, they are wary of additional stimulus programs because they know they've had to clean up the past ones. But they get their own interest groups. They have their own politics. And the question would be, how slow could growth go before they get pushed to do more? So far, they've just done it with turning nozzles a little bit here or there. As for the structural reforms themselves, um, in a very typical Chinese fashion. There were 326 points that came out of the third plenum. The ministers and the deputy premiers m monitor those points. They're kind of checking them off. And I guess I, I see a little bit more prospect uh, for progress than at least you suggest in your question. And let me just start. Tax reform. This is Lu Jiawei, the finance minister's number one aim. He, he partly has to deal with moving from a turnover tax to a value-added tax. He's partly going to adjust resource pricing. But his biggest challenge is what I would call fiscal federalism, changing the revenue and expenditure patterns at different levels of government. So, for example, a provincial or local leader doesn't have to take somebody's land to finance something, which goes right back to the question of social stability and support for the party. Um, the the uh, household registration, labor mobility system, the HUCO system. When I was there in December, I talked with Vice Premier Wang Yang. I asked about this. He said, very interesting. He said, that very week, the state council had approved 100 <laughs> pilots, which is often the way the Chinese reform process works. Very different parts of the country to understand how to make this work. Third, environment. I mean, it's quite clear this is, again, a matter of social stability and party support because if people are worried about the health of their children, they see the air that they're supposed to be breathing, that's not good. The fourth one is the open capital account, which I continue to be impressed that while there's a long way to go, mm -hmm. that led by Governor Zhou and others on the financial side, they have learned the lesson that some countries in East Asia, Japan and Korea in particular, <laughs> grew quite well, but if they couldn't move capital from different sectors, that they would stymie growth. And so this, again, has a considerable place to go. Now, there, there are issues such as state-owned enterprises, which I think they're struggling to deal with. Um, what's interesting also is the role of the private sector. So um, if, if people at the school haven't looked at this, I commend a book that was uh, uh, 
Nick Lardy. Nick Lardy's book about markets over Mao, where you see the performance of the private sector over the public sector. And, and so this is one of the ironies of policy. In Washington, I'm dealing with people who think, oh, state capitalism is the new future. And so, <laughs> you know, they're trying to, in a sense, move in that direction, while the Chinese are trying to figure out how to yeah. move away from state capitalism because it isn't as efficient uh, and it can build in some pretty high externality costs. Now, having said this, though, you concluded with a point which I think is very important, which is while I think they're not to be underestimated, these are huge challenges. And, and there are undoubtedly going to be slips along the way and there's going to be trouble along the way. And the magnitude of this task cannot be uh, underestimated. And so um, my bottom line is I'm impressed with what they're doing, uh, but do I know whether they'll be successful? It's hard to say. I wouldn't bet against them, but I don't think this is going to be a straight line of progress either. And I think the Chinese officials know that, and that actually goes right back to my point about some of the things that Xi Jinping has done on the party side, mm -hmm. which is I think he's trying to make sure he's got authority to press forward with reforms and, frankly, stop some of the inevitable uh, criticisms that he'll get from various constituencies. Well, let, let me bring in that, uh, that political dimension more explicitly. The title of Nick Lardy's book, and Nick was, uh, gave a talk about it here uh, late last year, is uh, Markets Over Mao, uh, which reminds me, uh, it must be the year before last, you had a column in the Financial Times, I think it was soon after the third plenum, uh, where you talked about Mao and markets. So my, my, my question is, is this. Um, we have a fast-changing economic system in China. It's become globally integrated. But the political system has remained, in broad terms, largely static. And what we've seen since President Xi uh, assumed office is uh, an intent to go more in the direction of markets, but at the same time, as you put it in that, uh, in that column, more Mao as well. So we have a centralization of power, we have a political crackdown on dissent, uh, uh, more uh, limits on what we in the West would understand as an open society, which makes me wonder, beyond the short term, uh, how compatible is this with more of a market economy? Uh, or is there some essential incompatibility down the line that would have negative effects on both the economic reform program and indeed on the polity? Excellent question. Um, there's a lot that one can do uh, by simply bringing in uh, competition and what I'll loosely call a more level, fair playing field. And, and, uh, and the types of reforms that I talked about, tax, capital flows, others could go a long way. But here, I guess I'll reference Lee Kuan Yew. I've always had a feeling that unless you have a rule of law system and a, a, a true fair rule of law system, that there will be a hurdle uh, that, uh, that can't be cleared in terms of, of upper stages of development. Now, the Chinese also recognize this. At the, at the fourth plenum, there was a discussion of rule of law, but for people here probably know this better than I do, there's Chinese traditions of rule by law as opposed to rule of law, and they, there's a question of exactly the extent of that rule of law development. And the core question will be, will the law apply to the party? Will the party be subject to the same system? Now, you know, I could, I could see aspects of this developing, I, in maybe in the commercial side versus other sides. The Singapore story is an example of uh, opening up economic liberalization, but over time, you start out with uh, a political system that was much more restricted. I think over time that has evolved and will continue to evolve. Um, and so uh, could I see that, that uh, there's a prospect for change that, uh, that could clear this hurdle? Yes, but right now I, I keep coming back to the question of I think there's a big risk that the things that Xi Jinping is doing 
uh, in terms of political power and social dissent dealing um, could, while I, I can understand them from his perspective, that I think ultimately they could backfire in the system. Um, and you even see this in, a, in the near term now, the anti-corruption campaign, this again, I'm more relying on anecdotal uh, evidence, has created an uncertainty of what the rules are. You know, and some people would even say, some Chinese officials say, look, if you start those rules now, I'll work with them. But in the past, I couldn't achieve the things unless I took various actions. And, and the, one, the, the part that I tried to draw attention to, particularly in that FT piece, was the self-criticism. Mm -hmm. This is very mm -hmm. Maoist, and you know, maybe people here follow China closely enough, you know, but you know, people all crawl across different ministries, agencies, departments, were asked to write things that are basically a bill of indictment. I mean, you know, if you say, look, my problem is I work too hard, I'm too devoted to China and the party, so on and so forth, people will say, that's probably the way all of you will do your uh, self-recognition forms for school. Um, but they, they say, go back and write it again. And I know one individual said, he, his boss said, oh, I had 14,000 characters. You only had 9,000 characters. You must go back and do it again. But if you then say, look, I took a little gratuity, or my cousin got this benefit, or so on and so forth, they may not act on it, but it's there on the file to go at you. So my own sense is that the nature of a capitalist and open market system, which could operate in various different forms, as we've seen all across Singapore, Europe, the United States, others, um, that that will be a hurdle they'll eventually have to clear in terms of rule of law. And uh, I don't know how that will turn out. Um, one, one, one question on how all of this translates into China's external role. Uh, in its East Asian backyard, in the wider Asia, and indeed in the, uh, in the wider world. And that leads me back to that term you coined back when you were Deputy Secretary of State in that speech you gave uh, of China becoming a responsible stakeholder in a liberal international economic order. Uh, Western liberals would say that that's in the interest of the rest of the world, it's in the interest of China. But how is it viewed from, from Beijing? Um, I mean, clearly there are some, including the reformers you talk to, who take this view, broadly speaking. But um, there are presumably others who have a different view. Uh, and the analogy here perhaps is more with the rise of Germany and Japan before World War I. Um, China's interest, if one follows this line of thinking, is, is not in strong liberal multilateralism with rules having been written by the United States. It's about something else. It's perhaps more bilateral, more regional, more mercantilist. Uh, how, how, how do you read that, that mix, looking at it from Beijing? Uh. Well, this is a topic, as we say, for a rich discussion. <laughs> uh, but, but let me suggest it this way. Um, you, you asked me to, to view it from Beijing. I naturally have view it more from kind of the Western debate. And what I'll, let me start with the Western debate. This is a very important topic, including for East Asia and Singapore, uh, because a very eminent respected person such as Henry Kissinger believes that China by its very nature can only operate in a system of tributary relations yeah. going back to its history. So while he's courteous with me, he tends to be much more suspicious that China could be integrated into the international system. Uh, but part of this I think goes back to your question about economics and foreign policy. Uh, Dr. Kissinger's background is very much on the security yeah. side. He jokes about his lack of knowledge of economics. Um, and, and frankly, what I think you see is in the economic realm, there has been more effort to integrate. This is how Zhu Ranji used the WTO accession to, yeah. the, to drive the reforms. It's a discussion in China now about bilateral investment treaty. There's a, it, it's our Asian infrastructure bank example. Um, and, you know, is it perfect? No, but no participation is perfect in the system. And I think the economic reformers, and I pose this question to them, sort of, are they continue to actually follow that sort of model? 
Um, now, on the political security side, I think you have a different set of issues. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this has also created anxieties in places like Washington and in the business community with things like the commercial cyber espionage. And there's even a danger on the economic side now, which will always be present in any country, which is if you've got 1.3 billion people and you're moving to value-added industries, some people may say, look, let's just keep that market for ourselves. We'll keep everybody off and we'll do quite well. This is the indigenous innovation. When I was trade representative, I discussed this with senior Chinese officials and I said, I'm not surprised that you have people who argue this, but keep in mind, Deng Xiaoping's strategy was to engage with the other seven billion people in the world to learn what they have and also to be able to exchange and access their markets. So if you develop a technology industry that is disconnected from the rest of the world, ultimately China is going to lose. But that'll be a debate within the, the Chinese system. I think on the political security side, um, as you at least suggested in your comments, as China grows, uh, it will assert certain uh, sense of prerogatives in, in particularly in this region, in the East Asia region. And the question will be in part how others in the region respond, how the United States supports that response. It's my belief that the international security and economic order that the United States helped create 70 years ago has been to everybody's benefit. And so when Xi Jinping says Asia for Asians, that kind of suggests a very different mm -hmm. system. And uh, I'm not so sure, well, I, I know the United States would not accommodate that, and the question would be, how do others see that? So uh, I partly have touched on this because this is very much a debate in the United States at present, and some of the people in this audience will be influential in this because there's a lot of respect for Singapore and others, and people in the United States want to get the perspective of those in the region. I think in China, my sense is that uh, in general, uh, because of the challenges we both discussed, that <coughs> Xi Jinping understands he needs to keep a benign international environment, the Deng Xiaoping strategy, but inevitably China will be more assertive, it will be more demanding of its prerogatives, it will seek uh, respect for its views, and the question is, whether those can be done in a way that can accommodate not just the United States, but Japan and ASEAN and others in the region. So that's, in a sense, the foreign and security challenge going forward. One last thought, and because people in this audience would probably understand this better than they would in the U.S., U.S. policymaking is often, with its pragmatism, sort of case by case. People want to know what's the results, what's you know the practice, how to make things work in practice. That's what you have when you have lawyers in charge. <laughs> well, Dean Atchison was a lawyer, and Dean Atchison <laughs> helped create a pretty good international system, so counterpoint. Uh, so so uh, in China, however, there is much more of a view of let's get the overarching concept right, then principles, then apply it. So the reason I draw on this is that uh, my friend Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister of Australia, who's a student of China, speaks Mandarin, actually believes that new type of great power relationship was a response to responsible stakeholder. And that while many in China um, appreciated the kind of the recognition of China's role, others of course said, well, you're telling us you have to abide by your system and so on and so forth. And new type of great power relationship, which still, by the way, I don't think has been spelled out very much, is more of a balance of power concept. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the challenges for the United States, China, Singapore, others in ASEAN, Japan, Europe, if it decides to engage, is how could one define new type of great power relationship in a way that avoids conflict of rising powers and other powers, but also continues to promote the integration of the system? And I'm sorry, I'll add one last thought to this. One of the challenges for people in dealing with the United States in this, is that the standard way of, historical way of thinking about great powers is there's the rising power and there's the status quo power. But keep in mind where the United States becomes very confusing is that while it's the established power, it is not a status quo power. I mean, if anything, what creates uncertainty around the world is the United States isn't just trying to preserve the status quo, it's trying to change the system. Okay, so in some ways, if you think about China's comment about non-interference in, in internal matters, that is the status quo yeah. <laughs> sort of piece of Westphalia model, 
The United States is the revolutionary power because it wants to expand certain ideals and democracies and values. So what complicates this is that established power, yes, status quo power, no. The city on the hill. Shining city on the hill. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, one quick question on India, and then I'm going to open it to, to the floor. Um, uh, a, a decade ago, we had India shining. And then I think it was Jairam Ramesh who coined the term Chindia, which had uh, visiting Chinese rolling in the aisles with laughter at the first sight of Delhi and Bombay airports. Um, and then a big growth slowdown. And then a change election last year uh, with uh, the BJP under Mr. O Modi elected with uh, an overwhelming mandate. Since then, we've seen mini reforms uh, rather on the Gujarat model, some new reforms announced in the, uh, in the recent budget. But uh, contrary to the hopes of uh, market liberals, we haven't seen really major structural reforms in India on land, on labor, on infrastructure, and a whole host of other issues. So what's your, what's your take on, um, on, on the prospects for structural reforms in India how that might translate into a higher growth rate. Um, and is it really the case that, you know, some already say that um, Mr. Modi has squandered perhaps a once in a generation opportunity for really fundamental reforms because he has the mandate, but the honeymoon won't last? Well, I'll share with you some of my views but I'll also incorporate in them some from some Indians, including in the business sector, who I have high respect for and are on the scene. Uh, first, uh, Modi is not to be underestimated. This is a person who <coughs> clearly is committed to transform the system, and he showed that he could do so at the Gujarat level. Second, as you say, it's a mistake to expect a big bang, Thatcherite economic reform. That, that isn't the plan, that's not India, that's not what he has in mind. Third, it's important to recognize that Modi sees markets and the private sector as contributing to a social purpose. Some, when I talk sometimes to business people around the world, I often explain this is a case for emerging markets more generally. <clears throat> in the United States, frankly, the view of business people is if it's market, it's allowed by law, you can make money, go do it. Okay, fine. But in emerging markets, you often have to connect your business purpose with some value that people are trying to accomplish in the society. And at another level, uh, I guess the fourth point is, is that the BJP and Modi are very sensitive to the social base of the pyramid and some of the welfare provisions, and mm -hmm. so they're going to adjust those over time in a very careful way. Now, what does that all amount to? As you said, uh, there have been some signs that they're willing to take on some issues in railways and railway fares, some energy subsidies and others. But people who expected the budget to kind of lead mm -hmm. to a gra gross transformation uh, have been disappointed. And India, you also have to look at the cycle. India's got a benefit now, lower oil prices, some of the work of the central bank and others kind of has the wind at its back, so it's likely to have a reasonable growth rate anyway. And I guess what I would say is the challenge, in, what, the challenge for India will always be implementation. And one of the big questions that people who know India much better than I do point to is the prime minister's office seems to have been about triple in size. And people are often outside the prime minister's office are afraid to act because this is such a strong leader. The question is, can one man or one prime minister's office really drive change across the complexities of India? And my own sense is, is that what you'll see is a continuation of even what you saw when Congress government tried to do reforms, which is that some states will move faster than others. So when people ask me about India, I say, which India? So yeah. some of my Singapore friends said, you know, after Modi was elected, there was a much more uh, frequent visitors of some of the chief secretaries from the different states coming to Singapore to learn kind of how uh, Singapore did these things. Uh, so I think that uh, he's unleashed an initiative, he's unleashed a process of change. Uh, I think it will get some traction. 
And the ultimate story, coming back to my World Bank experience, will be can people execute on the ground? So when I was at the World Bank, I actually fought to try to expand our lending limit to India, and I wanted to do more with India. Um, but one of the challenges I had is we'd come up with billions of billions of commitment numbers, but when it came time to the disbursements, it was really hard to get the money out the door. You know, and so this is true with the land issues. It's true with kind of a series of legal restrictions. So <clears throat> my own sense is that from the biggest picture, it's very important that Modi succeed. I don't think, again, it's going to be done overnight because I think Congress is in disarray. You have a series of regional forces in India. And as one Indian who I respect a lot say, if Modi doesn't succeed, this will be a very dark picture. So I'm an optimist by nature, uh, and I think he's got enough momentum behind him, and I think you see enough set of change that I think we'll see progress. Uh, but that's what I would watch. And at the end of the day, the question is execution. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's let's now uh, open it uh, open it up to to the floor. I'm sure there are uh, lots of questions. Uh, there are mics on that side and on that side. Uh, please tell us uh, who you are, your affiliation, uh, if any, and keep your questions or comments uh, brief and concise. Uh, we always say that, and it's uh, it often doesn't work. But I'm saying it again. Uh, please please make your interventions as concise as possible. Over there. Thank you, Ian Chong. So I want to pick up on. Could you tell me where you're from? Just right. Oh, uh, NUS. So uh, I want to pick up on y your earlier comments on the AIIB. So um, I understand your critique of uh, the U.S. administration, the Obama administration's uh, approach to the AIIB. But what would you suggest that the administration do now? It's put uh, some prestige on pre previously on trying to prevent allies from joining, but now allies have joined, um, and and more and more seem to be doing so. Uh, would would the uh, would the Obama administration have to sort of go to China now and say yes, sorry, we're wrong, we were being dumb, uh, please work with us now? I mean, so I understand the critique. Yeah, no, but, it's, but a, what's the solution? it's a good policy question. Um, um, and so, sorry, just yeah. one other one other thing too. Um, so for an economy, you talk about innovation. So for an economy that is um, that you know has a big government role that doesn't have the sort of freedom of access to information, um, you know, and and is uh, you know it's deeply integrated but fairly small, like Singapore. You know, how, how would you um, propose innovation to take place? I mean, having a Lee Kuan Yew is not a solution. That's winning the genetic lottery. That's not innovation. So thanks. Those two questions. Um, on your first question, uh, very important policy lesson for all of you to apply. Uh, when when you when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. That's the starting point. Um, uh, and it's interesting you ask this, because again, uh, I've actually reflected on this a little bit over the past day, I guess just out of policy practice. I think what I would probably do would be I would identify the priority features that I think it's important to include in the Asian Infrastructure Bank. <coughs> And here I've got a little unfair advantage since I used to be in that business. There's a kind of how you do the procurement, uh, different aspects of the governance structure. I'll, I'll give you an example. Is, uh, um, when I was at the World Bank, I did a, we worked out an arrangement with all the regional development banks, Europe, Asia, Inter-American Bank, Africa, so that we, uh, if, if some country was um, banned from doing business because they had been found to be corrupt, that we all banned them. People might be surprised. We didn't have that procedure. So there are ways in which the World Bank and the regional development banks already had sort of intercooperation on things. So I would identify the core issues, okay? And um, I would then, uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and in particular, perhaps even a level beyond, which is to say, you know, I remember visiting Laos, and, and the World Bank had a very extensive uh, dam project, Nam Thang Dang. It took a long time because there were various criticisms. But at the end, it was an incredibly effective project environmentally, relocating people, so on and so forth. And frankly, I was a little worried about some of the, the dams I saw getting put up on the Mekong uh, River and others. So maybe I'd even take some specific areas and say, for infrastructure development, you know, these are areas that have to be done under a certain way. And I'd come up with some reasonable number of items. 
And then I would urge uh, the leaders in China, I'd urge Jinlin Quinn, who I think is open to try to do some of these things, and, and I would urge um, the countries joining it to kind of agree on a set and then push them all together. And then I would simultaneously suggest that the World Bank's arms, like whether the IFC or the Infrastructure Center here in Singapore, <coughs> offer to cooperate with the Infrastructure Bank on infrastructure projects and develop some terms of engagement. So I, you know, I've seen people talk about co-investment. That, that's just a, that's a sideline, okay? It's really the structure you create of these arrangements. And then frankly, uh, this is also is a useful test because if the Asian Infrastructure Bank is unwilling to make these changes, well then some of the US criticisms are valid. <laughs> you know, and then people will have to make their own decision. But I would give people the benefit of the doubt and I would at least try to identify what are the things. And I, I, you know, at the end of the day, you have to put coefficients on with these. So do I really care whether it's a residential board versus an outside board? To be honest, the residential board, which I had to deal with, was an, 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 it was sort of a legacy of pre-air travel, okay? So look, I had 25 executive directors, board members, okay? They were on site and they had a staff of 300 and it was a $70 million a year cost, okay? That we had to try to, frankly, keep them contented, right? And it was a stupid system. And, and frankly, Governor Zadillo, or former President Zadillo of Mexico, did a review of governance. And so the idea that the United States says, oh, you need an on-site board, I, that's not the critical thing. Remember, APEC started, actually, without a big system. We constantly use senior officials. So I'd focus on the substance of kind of how to make that work. And then I'd you know, press the discussions with other partners and others. For your second question about innovation in China, or in Singapore, uh, I'm not the one to talk. This country's done pretty well. Um, you know, so I guess I, I would focus on principles, which is the principles to keep yourself open to competition, uh, you know, make sure that you've got easy to have people sort of come and go, uh, create the right investment environment. Um, I was explaining when I negotiated the free trade agreement with Singapore in 2001 and two. My counterpart was George Yeo, a good friend, and I remember saying to George, George, you know, I'm really glad we did this. It's important for our two countries. It's important for the region. But you're a pretty free trading country. What was your interest in it, other than the association with the United States? And I was struck by the fact that he said, we need to move up the value added chain. And frankly, your free trade agreements are seen as having the highest quality intellectual property rights. So we want to set that standard and then we think it'll draw more knowledge industries. And I remember a few years later coming to visit part of Singapore and seeing all these pharmaceutical companies and others. So I guess you know, I, I would focus more on, on the principles. And then I suppose the other thing which Singapore is doing to a degree is um, you, you can seed the sort of the intellectual capability, you know, whether it's biotechnology, whether it's other things, you, could, you can foster research various types of R&D. Now probably the late Lee Kuan Yew and I would agree, I don't believe in just throwing money at stuff. So then you also have to set some standards and result measurements. So I guess I would focus on that. And, and, uh, and I guess the last point really will be the challenge for Singapore will be whether the larger ecosystem of education and work and others can encourage creativity. And there, there are aspects of the system that could foster that, but there's other aspects of the system that might stymie that. And so I've actually been impressed that to take a slightly different example of how in the education system here, not surprisingly, this is a very meritocratic system. And the people that rise to the top obviously perform very well on tests, and they perform in a very certain academic uh, sort of pattern. But I was struck that there was a recognition that some people learn differently. Some people learn more visually, They've got to working on projects. And the educational system here seems to be trying to adapt and realize that people learn in different patterns. So I'll just say this. I'm not trying to just flatter people. You know, I, I, I've enjoyed the interactions I've had with Singapore ministers over 25 years. I don't always agree with everything. I learn a lot. And, and I think that this slight sense of uh, paranoia is probably a healthy quality. Okay. Right.
Thank you. Uh, gentleman over there, and then I'll come to you. Good afternoon. Um, Miket from NTU. Um, how would you like to see the relationship between Singapore, no, between US and China evolving over the next five years? Between US and China, and US and ASEAN? Um, best case scenario, likely case scenario, and worst case scenario over the next five years? Thank you. Are you allowed to ask multi part questions like that? <laughs> um, well, over the next five years, uh, I, I would like to see uh, the United States be supportive of China's economic reforms and to do so in a way that China takes further steps in terms of its international economic obligations, for example, a bilateral investment treaty with a negative list and, uh, and uh, a open service sector, which could be done in the WTO negotiations, that would help China, that would help the United States, and would help the world economic institutions. So I have a, kind of a list of those items. Um, I, the issue that I'm extremely concerned about is cybersecurity. Uh, and uh, while countries are going to spy on each other, and I'm not shocked by that, one of the challenges the United States has is explaining to China that it's okay to spy on the government, but it's not okay to spy on companies and steal their stuff. <laughs> it's a serious issue. I mean, and, and, and frankly, uh, I had talked with some of my colleagues in the Obama administration. Tom Donilon was one of them, who is a national security advisor, trying to have this discussion with China uh, before the Snowden stuff came broke and kind of killed the whole climate for it. I would like to see some progress made on that issue because I think it's one that would be very, it's very dangerous for the international economy and relations. Um, and then uh, third, on the political security front, I would like to see um, uh, China work out its relationships with ASEAN, Japan, Korea, India, others in the region in a way that recognizes the stability of the international system we've created over the past 70 years and uh, it creates an environment where all can prosper together. And uh, if I get another one, I guess I would also say that on issues of carbon and some of the energy developments, that's another sort of critical area that I think both could make progress. Uh, and maybe even on the broader political security side, to continue to encourage China and the United States to find mutual interests in, for example, dealing with the danger of North Korea or stability in Afghanistan and Pakistan, <clears throat> and seeing, while there's never going to be a total alignment, to try to understand things. So let me give you a very practical example, is that when, um, when I had the first strategic talks with Dai Bing Wo when I was at the State Department, which became these various strategic dialogues, I said to him, look, um, I'm not trying to suggest the United States is, is pushing this, but let's assume someday that North Korea collapses. Okay? What happens to stability in the region? Okay? And I said, now, your first reaction in China might be that you wouldn't want a unified Korea to keep its alliance with the United States. I said, but part of that might be a concern that the United States would have military forces on the Yalu, which I don't believe it would. I believe actually the land forces would be withdrawn. You might keep some air and naval assets. <clears throat> and I said, but, but think about the alternative. Let's say South Korea with its history no longer has an alliance relationship with the United States or a unified Korea. And yet it inherits a nuclear weapon. Might it keep it, given its big neighbors in Russia, China, Japan? And if, if, South, if Korea does that, what will that do in Japan? All of a sudden, Russia, China, Korea, the United States all have nuclear weapons, but Japan doesn't. So these are some of the stabilizing issues. And, and I'll tell you the one that people need to think about now, again, is that let's just assume someday that North Korean regime did collapse. What would happen to the nuclear facilities? Do the Chinese secure them? Do the South Koreans secure them? Do we do them jointly? Do we ignore them and let this stuff go out? So, you know, these are the tough public policy questions that, from my spirit, at least the United States and China need to get those on the table, need to be thinking about those uh, sort of topics. So I think there's a very large 
positive agenda. But I also, if you talk about the US perspective, and just because you asked about ASEAN, the United States, while there's a lot it can do with China, always needs to approach this from a regional and alliance perspective. So at the same time, we need to have strong ties with Japan, with Korea, with Australia, with our ASEAN partners, and not to contain China, because I don't think you can. I think that's a fool's errand and you'll lose your friends. But to try to create some hedge in relationships and let China know that when it gets too aggressive and starts to threaten other countries, that that'll be counterproductive. So from a US policy perspective, it is just a, a good little footnote for you to keep in mind. Whenever you think about a bilateral relationship, you also ought to think about the regional and alliance relationships. Uh, my name is uh, Anant Nageshwar, and recently I co-authored a book with your former colleague, uh, Dr. T.V. Somanathan, TV mm. as you call him, yeah. on derivatives. Uh, I'm adjunct faculty at the Singapore Management University here. Uh, on October 26th, you wrote a piece in the FT and you said, a topic of interest for the U.S. and Germany would be to explore whether Germany and the U have a role in Asia beyond commercial ties. What exactly did you have in mind? Has it happened? If not, what are the steps that need to happen for it to happen? Thank you. Sure. Well, for the context for the piece, and it's a good question, I'm glad you asked it, because it takes what we've discussed in Asia and puts it to a different context. <laughs> so to give people a reference point, 25 years ago, I was the US representative that, under Secretary Baker that negotiated German unification in the two plus four process. And part of our strategic perspective in 1989-90 was that Germany would become the most important country in Europe and, and we needed to deepen our partnership. We fortunately uh, stood by our ally at a moment of national challenge where others in Europe were more hesitant, uh, but gratitude doesn't last too long in foreign relations. So part of it would be, would Germany and the United States, recognizing this can only be done in European structures, because Germany is embedded in Europe, uh, see broader responsibilities. So what I talked about in that piece was, this is a tough question for Germans, for understandable reasons. Uh, you know, the word for leadership is, is, is uh, Führer in Germany, and that's not a wonderful connotation. So there's, there's some hesitancy. Having said this, I actually think Chancellor Merkel has tried to do some pretty good things overall with Russia and Ukraine and also with, uh, with some of the issues in the Eurozone. Um, so I was trying to outline in a sense that I, I think both sides, the US and Germany, had taken each other for granted. And going back to these questions about strategic discussions, we were just dealing case by case with matters as opposed to trying to think about some of the longer trends and how to try to deal with them. And one of those was the role in Asia. And my point was that in my experience in China, that uh, Germany has a lot of respect. There's a respect for Germany's economy, a respect for Germany's engineering. There's less respect for the European Union as a whole. Um, <clears throat> Wang Qishan, when he was in charge of economic relations, once told me, uh, he said, you know, I get these people coming from Brussels, and they tell me they want me to do A, B, and C, and I say, fine, I'd like you to do D, E, and F, and they say, oh, no, that's the member states. We can't do that. And he said, well, then send the member states. So, you know, this is, it's a little, a bit of a quip, but I think it re reflects a little bit of uh, kind of a Chinese perspective. And so my point with uh, Germany and Asia was that I think by and large, Europe simply seized East Asia in terms of commercial and business. I've got nothing against that. But I think if you take what we've just discussed about big changes in an international order and stability, uh, take the question about the Asian infrastructure bank, I believe that the U.S. was mistaken in its approach, but I also believe Europe and others should insist on the types of things that we've talked about so that the Asian Infrastructure Bank does become a positive contribution to the international economic system. And there will be other issues, there, whether it be issues of uh, proliferation uh, or, uh, frankly, maritime security, which is in interest of all parties. And so I, you know, I believe that Europe can play a constructive role in this region, and from the U.S. perspective, uh, I would like it to do so, and I think Germany will be key to that. Okay. Um, would you have time for one last question? Uh, I don't know. Mary, uh, <laughs> I'm on my way to the airport. We'll take okay. one more. Okay. Very quickly, please. Uh, could you give us your perspective on the 
Iranian-UK negotiations? That was a long last question. Um, <laughs> uh, first point, I think it's important for the United States and others not to look at the nuclear negotiations alone. I think it's very important to look at Iran's behavior and aims in the region as a whole. Um, and I don't, I don't think you can separate those, and certainly in the minds of some of the Gulf states in the Arab world I just visited, much less Israel, the concern about Iranian behavior in Lebanon, uh, Syria, Iraq, perhaps Yemen, go to the overall question of stability in the region. It's a, we talked about stabilizing influences more broadly. That's part of it. Um, secondly, um, I think that uh, uh, I'm certainly not against trying to discuss to achieve a, uh, a, a deal that would deal, uh, that would, would address the Iranian nuclear threat. But part of that, of course, in my mind, would also go to the questions of past Iranian behavior with the nuclear program that the IAEA has identified that people haven't been clear about. And whatever arrangement you put together, and let's just say uh, there are people, whether in the US or frankly, some Israeli security figures that said, look, if you could, if you could deal the variables in a way that you had enough warning period, whether it's a year or two years, that could be more satisfactory than other alternatives. My own guess is that really requires a very intrusive inspection system. <clears throat> so that's a key point. I have been extremely troubled by this notion that the deal would end in X years because at the end of it you take off all the sanctions and where are you, okay? And, and where I and I don't say this lightly, but I, I disagree also with the administration on this idea that it's either a deal or war. We talked about negotiations. That's a hell of a way to negotiate. Um, you know, and frankly, I do think there are other options related to sanctions and, uh, and frankly, having the Iranians also recognize that if they cross lines, they run risks without being specific for other parties. So I'll close with this because part of this, I've done negotiations all my life. I, I, I think the administration made a very big mistake in dividing this into two parts and accepting the principle of enrichment de facto, if not de jure, in the first stage. Because the major thing you had to give, <clears throat> because under the NPT and the system, they're not supposed to be enriching. That's, you've got a lot of UN resolutions. To have accepted that in the first stage, in my mind, means that it's going to be very hard <laughs> to get the other aspects that you need uh, in subsequent stages. Um, Having said all this, uh, I think there's also alliance dimensions about how you work with your other partners in the region. And here's one, just to give a sum of thought. Uh, there's some people that feel that the administration believes that Iran could be changed into a stabilizing force in the region, that it's not just nuclear. I'm pretty skeptical of that. I'm actually worried that if there is a deal that certain forces in Tehran might actually feel the need to be more aggressive in the region to demonstrate that they still have their independent action. And so there will be a need to work with the Saudis, the other Gulf states, as well as Israel, to be very clear on how we'll respond to different types of behavior. Uh, having said all that, you know, I, I've not been of the view that some where um, you know, uh, you can conclude before you see the deal. But I'm concerned for the reasons that I mentioned. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, well, we've been uh, treated to uh, a masterclass in uh, policy analysis ranging from the economic to the security across uh, the whole world. Please join me in thanking Bob Zellick. Ladies and gentlemen.